everybody? We've got the middle schoolers, right? Very cool. Nice to see everybody, finally, after months and months. So I trust you guys have been having an awesome conference so far. And what we're going to do is go through kind of two big pieces of scripture. So I'm going to give you a minute. If you have a device, um, you can pull it up probably and then put another scripture in history. We're going to read through both. If you have your Bibles, um, what I want you to do is turn to Colossians 3 first and kind of stick part of your hand in there once you get there because I'm going to have you turn to another part of scripture. You need to be able to kind of flip. So Colossians 3 to start. And once you find Colossians 3, I want you to go to Psalm 95. So find Colossians 3. It's right after like Galatians, Ephesians. So I'm going to wait a, a minute and give everybody some time to turn. So Colossians 3. And then kind of keep your hand there and go to Psalm 95. So I'm going to pull mine up too so that I'm in the right spot. So this topic is about the call and the importance of worshiping together. So I want you to just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We'll start in Psalm 95, but before we read, we're going to pray. So let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we just ask, Lord, as we go through your word, we know that your word does not return void. Please speak to us this morning and help all of us to understand what you want us to know about the call and the importance of worshiping together. Help me decrease so that you can increase and speak to everyone that's here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start in Psalm 95. We're going to read through it. And then we're going to flip and go to Colossians 3. So here we go. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now flip to Colossians 3. Give you a second to get there. Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in those things, but now you yourselves are to put off all these so that stuff that we just read, and this stuff, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, 
circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, And spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So it's a lot that we covered. So let's kind of recap here, real quick. The topic is the call and the importance of worshiping together, right? So in Psalm 95, we start out with David, and it doesn't say that it was written by David, but Hebrews 4, 7, the writer actually says that this was a Psalm of David. So we know that David made a call, and in Hebrews, I'm sorry, in in Psalm 95, it's really cool to hear as David is speaking to the congregation, he uses all these plural nouns or plural ways to refer to the people that he's speaking to. He says, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. And then he continues through. Do you think he's talking to one person or multiple people? Multiple, right? He's clearly talking to multiple people. And if you think about David, what does the Bible kind of describe him as, the, the main phrase that it uses to describe David? Go ahead. Exactly. He was a man after God's own heart. He was someone who got it. He understood that following the Lord wasn't just about sacrifices. Because remember, in Psalm, in Psalm 95, what we're looking at is this context of a people that related to God through sacrifice, right? If they wanted to worship the Lord, what did they have to bring? Sacrifices of some kind, whether it was animals or meal offerings, grain offerings, things like that. So when David is talking to these people, he is, of course, kind of talking about through that context the idea of bringing sacrifice But it's interesting when we get to the end of the psalm, in um, some of the versions like the New King James, it switches from David speaking to in verse like 7 and 8 is the switch. It says, today if you will hear his voice, and then it's the Lord speaking, don't harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers, so he's speaking, the Lord, speaking to the congregation, your fathers tested me. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. And he concludes what he says, the Lord does, by saying, they, uh, it's a people who go astray in their hearts. They do not know my ways. And then as we flip over to Colossians, we hear Paul And in a way, he now is speaking to the entire congregation. So if Paul is speaking to everybody, and he says in Colossians 3, verse 1, if then you were raised with Christ, who do you think he's speaking to? If you were raised in Christ, who is he speaking to? Are you all of us, right? Exactly. So he's saying anybody who has given their life to Christ, then you are raised with Christ. And he's telling us, seek those things which are above, right? So let's focus in on Colossians 3, and we're going to start in verse 
12. And we're going to kind of break down. What does it look like then? We know David is telling us we need to come and worship together. We know the Lord told us at the end of Psalm 95 that they erred in their hearts. So it wasn't that... he didn't say, hey guys, you know, your, your main problem was you kept bringing me these lame sacrifices and that's why I had a problem. Or, you know, you, you kept forgetting about the staff and you kept forgetting about the water being divided. I mean, that was important, but ultimately, he said, you never gave me your heart. You never, and then followed that with, you never knew my ways. So here in Colossians 3, verse 12, let's kind of pick it up there. So we know that we're being kind of included in, well, totally, we're being included in who Paul is speaking to. Therefore, as the elect of God, who's elect of God? We are, right? If we know Christ, we are elect of God. He tells us you're holy then you are beloved. So, knowing that, put on tender mercies. So, these, the concept of being merciful to others in a way that they don't deserve, perhaps. Kindness, showing kindness to people that maybe you wouldn't naturally just go out of your way to help. Having humility, So being someone who says, you know what, I'm going to put myself lower than those around me. Being meek. Meekness is so interesting. It's the concept of you have the power to do something, let's say. You could call someone out because they were rude to you. But you choose not to use that power, and instead, we go back to, you put on tender mercies, kindness, and humility, and therefore you were long-suffering with them. Just like the Lord. The Lord, isn't He long-suffering with us? Even though I sin again and again, as long as I'm willing to admit that I've made a mistake and come to Him, isn't He long-suffering with me? And He will forgive me. Then Paul says in verse 13, bearing with one another. Do you ever have somebody that really annoys you? Like, um, how many of you play online games? All right, quite a few of you. Do you ever get, like, to the point where you're just so tired of this person, like, messing up over and over again? Or maybe it's their attitude, and you're just like, hey, man, I just want to play anymore. I'm just going to go do something else. The Word tells us we're to bear with one another. So even when those annoyances are there and it's frustrating me, the Lord says, I want you to bear with one another and forgive one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Why? Why are we to forgive one another? Well, Paul tells us in the rest of verse 13, because it's even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Verse 14, but above all these things, so all that stuff is incredibly important, but what holds it together? He says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. How many of you have played with magnets before? Anybody? Okay, if I put a plus and a plus together, what happens? They separate. They repel, right? Like charges repel. There's this really cool thing if you get into, um, do any of you like science at all? So there's this amazing thing about atoms. In the atom, anybody know what two main particles are in the atom? Protons and neutrons. So what did we just say about protons? The, the plus and the plus. They separate. they separate, right? So if I pack a bunch of protons in the nucleus of an atom, shouldn't they separate? They should. What keeps them together? There's actually a term for it. It's called the supernuclear force, Okay? 
And have you ever seen the, what they call the periodic table of the elements, right? And it starts with like hydrogen and helium, and then it gets, the, the numbers get bigger and bigger, right? So like if you get to the middle and you look at gold, it's got like, I think it's 30-something protons in it. So that means there's more of these plus things together in the nucleus of the cell, and somehow they have to stay together. And when you get all the way down to the bottom, you get to like uranium. Do you know what they use uranium for? Nuclear bombs. Why? Because there's 232 of these positive things, these protons, inside the nucleus of a uranium atom. And somehow, all of those pluses are being held together against their will. And we know that the Lord holds together everything, right? So the supernuclear force, really the only way to explain it is the Lord's hand holding everything together. And here, it's described that love is the bond of perfection, can I, if you think about any of these things that we just read starting in verse 12, can I on my own, without any help from the Lord, can I always put on these tender mercies? Can I always be kind? Can I always have humility? Can I always be meek without any help from the Lord? No way. Not going to happen. I need help. I need something to hold these things together inside of me. And the Lord says that thing is love. Put on love. You know, when Jesus summed up the law and the prophets, anybody remember what he said? How did he sum it up? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? So he summed it up that way. Love is the key. And when we think about love, we think about Jesus giving his life for us. So now we get into verse 15. So we think about all the things he's telling us to put on, and love is the perfect bond that's going to hold all these things together and help us to love each other. And he says, now let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Were you called to be a Christian all by yourself that just kind of goes off into the wilderness like John the Baptist and never interacts with anybody else? Is that what Christianity is about? Certainly not. So then, what is Christianity? It's me being called, like Christ, to go into... Yes, go ahead, Peter. Christianity a promise? A promise? Yeah. What do you mean by that? It is. Because we're going to heaven to be uh, the bride for God. That's why I yep. have to make, uh, those promises. And you lead right into, I'm going to read Romans 12, verse 1 real quick. You don't have to turn there. And I think um, that Eric might have referred to this or something similar. But in Romans verse 12, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable, it says service in some versions, but it's actually your reasonable act of worship. So when I'm worshiping the Lord, a lot of times I think we tend to look at worship and say, well, it's singing. It's singing to the Lord and it's playing instruments and that's a part of it. But worship is so much more. And here Paul says that your sacrifice to the Lord is equivalent, your sacrifice of you, your body to the Lord is equivalent to worship. So I, just like Peter was saying, it's that promise. The, 
Lord gave his body for us. And in return, he says, I ask you to sacrifice your body to me. So if I've done that, now he fills me. That's where Paul in Colossians 3 says, then if you're risen with Christ, and we get to back to Colossians 3. So let me go there again real quick. So we were in verse Six, uh, let's see, 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, that is Christ, and be thankful. Now, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We're going to touch on that again in just a second. And then verse 17, and whatever you do in word, in the things you say or deed, the things that you act out among each other at work, someday when you guys are working, at school, at home, do all of those things in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, do you think, based on what we've read, that we're all called to worship together? Definitely. Does that mean it's primarily speaking about just singing together and playing instruments together? No. What else, then, are we doing together? Praying, reading the Bible, fellowshipping together and ultimately laying down our lives together. Because without that, we can't do any of this stuff. So let's look back at verse 16, because this is another question you're going to be talking about with your group. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Have any of you read through the book of Job? You don't have to answer with your hand raised. If you've ever read through the book of Job, it's a little bit long. I just finished it again this week. But it's fascinating because here you have Job, who the Lord, when he is speaking, Satan comes to present himself to the Lord. And the Lord says, where do you come from? Satan says, oh, you're walking to and fro throughout the earth. And the Lord says, have you seen my servant Job? And all this stuff then transpires where Job initially loses all his flocks, all his goods, his servants, and his kids. And the first thing he does is he worships. Then after that, after a correct response, Satan goes back, presents himself to the Lord. The Lord says, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan says a bunch of stuff about, well, you know, if, if, yeah, you took his stuff away, but if you touch him, then he'll curse you. And the Lord says, all right, I'm going to give him into your hands, just don't kill him. So then we see Job suffering immensely. Then his friends show up. And what's interesting is we don't see worship anymore. We saw Job worship after he lost everything around him. But then right after that, we don't see worship. And we don't see his friends who are willing to give their opinion over and over again, his three friends that show up, and Job responding. And what's fascinating is not once did Job or his friends say, you know what, we need to stop. Job, he's looking at himself, and he's like, you know, if I could just face the Lord and ask him, why is all this stuff happening to me? And his friends are telling him, I can tell you why this is happening to you. It's because you've messed up somewhere and you haven't repented. And Job's like, that's not it. And so they're going back and forth and back and forth, and none of them are looking up. They could have stopped, and they could have said, you know what? Let's just worship the Lord. Let's get our eyes on Him. They didn't do it. And it's so fascinating when Paul, in Colossians 3, he's saying, listen, All those guys in Job were very wise. They were very old. So they had lived through a lot of stuff. They knew a lot of stuff. And later in Job, we get this young guy, Elihu. 
who's just like, I am tired of listening to you guys. I held my peace because I'm young, and I don't have as much wisdom as you, perhaps, but man, I have got to say something. And he starts to exalt the Lord, and he tries to get their attention. He's like, you're, he tells Job, you're, you're basically saying I'm righteous. He's like, but if you were to compare yourself to the Lord, are you really? And so he tries to kind of realign what they're saying to each other, and he calls attention back to the Lord, and then finally the Lord speaks. We can't do, in verse 16, what Paul is telling us to do among each other if we don't let the Word of God dwell in us richly. What does that mean? How much time do I got? I got to stop. What does it mean to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly? Go ahead. Apply it to your life. So not just reading and saying, okay, I read my verses today or I read this chapter today, but applying it to your life. And I bet you're getting a lot of good teaching about how to apply the word to your life. I, think I heard some of that earlier when I got here. So we need to not just read it, but apply it. And then applying it, thank you for that answer, we need to teach and admonish each other. So if the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly, then when we're together, we'll be teaching and admonishing each other. We won't make the mistakes that Job's friends made because we'll be focused on the Lord with his word in our hearts. And we'll be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto the Lord. That's pretty cool. So it's not about, you know, uh, just the singing and just the playing of instruments and, you know, oh, that guy with the guitar made a mistake this morning. And man, you guys remember how like, it threw everything off? And no, it's about the singing and, and the playing of instruments, but also about admonishing each other and teaching each other because the word of Christ is dwelling in us richly. I'm reading it, and like you said, I'm applying it to my life. And when we do that, then we're really worshiping the Lord. And can we do any of that alone, by myself? No. If I'm admonishing and teaching, doesn't there have to be somebody around me for that to happen? So, I'm going to turn you over. I'm going to stop. I appreciate your time. And now you're going to be led by your group leaders through the two questions that you have. Thank you so much, guys.